suicide attacks and bomb blasts that began to erupt across the country and haven't abated since. But uh, in, the, in the very initial period, there was a lot of enthusiasm that was released. And of course, people like myself were hoping that this could go further and would, uh, that this would be merely just the first step um, that you know, all of us had taken in the direction of a democratic government and that we would take many other subsequent steps to really change the actual class base, basis of, of our society, of our state and society. Because in my opinion, um, in, you know, in Pakistan, which is what my thesis is also about, the class structure tends to be in Pakistan extremely rigid, extremely hierarchical, and extremely oppressive. <coughs> and the result of which is, of course, the lack of development of a democratic society. So, uh, so myself included, uh, and even those who may not have been of a socialist conviction, but certainly wanted to see a more progressive society, uh, of course, there were many um, uh, aspirations placed with that transformation, but it didn't uh, come through the way people had planned. And there are several reasons for that, one of which is that arguably parliamentary democracy is the best means available uh, to confuse the heck out of people, because people think, okay, now we have an elected government, so you know, we don't need to do anything else, so let's just go home and, and chill out, and that's of course the wrong message to, to, to get from any elected government, because you constantly have to be involved, engaged, and uh, um, you know, hold your uh, representatives to account, even in an elected government, that's the whole point. Nonetheless, and the second thing that, of course, uh, uh, led to a de-escalation of, of political involvement of a lot of people was that suddenly politics became extremely dangerous in Pakistan uh, with, through, so because of you know, terrorist attacks and so on. So, for instance, uh, the Awami National Party uh, has arguably suffered the, the biggest uh, uh, loss of life uh, out of all the mainstream parties in Pakistan. They've lost a lot of people because every time they hold a big rally, somebody walks in wearing a belt and blows himself up, and um, they've been deliberately targeting <coughs> the leaders. And then, of course, the um, Islamic radicals not only uh, declared war on the state or on the army or on the government or on political parties, but really actually on, um, on Pakistan society as a whole. So they have now by this time, and this is not, you know, because I'm, you know, believe me when I say this, it's not because I'm brainwashed by BBC or some imperialist propaganda or whatever. But really, this is something that we, I have seen with my own eyes um, living in Pakistan. So what are the facts? The facts are they blew up over a thousand schools in Khaybar uh, Pakhtunkhwa alone, uh, which is formerly known as Northwest Frontier Province. Uh, universities, Islamic University uh, cafeteria was bombed. My own university, the Lahore University of Management Sciences, stays open only with a sniper on the roof, sandbag bunkers in the front, and paramilitary forces all around. Um, and that's not just lungs. Uh, uh, that's pretty much every school and college where metal detectors and security, private security guards, etc., have to be placed in order for educational institutions to continue. Uh, hospitals have been attacked. Ski resorts have been attacked. And now the latest incident is that um, uh, Sufism, the shrines of Sufi saints have also come under attack. So there are four major shrines in Pakistan that have come under attack. The first was Rahman Baba in Khaybar Pakhtunkhwa. Then there was Data Darbar in Lahore, <coughs> I think seven, eight hundred year old shrine. Mm -hmm. Then there was uh, a, a Baba Farid shrine in Pakpatan, where in fact a week before the, the, the bomb blast, there uh, we shot our video against uh, extreme religious extremism and in support of Sufism. And then there was of course Abdullah Razi Shah in Karachi that was bombed. Um, and that's not the, that's not the end of, of, of the whole thing. Bazaars have been attacked in Pakistan, like Moon Market attack in Lahore was a horrible, horrible incident. Uh, hundreds of people were, uh, you know, um, died in that particular attack. So doing open politics, coming out in the streets, you know, occupying a university or whatever, uh, these things became, started becoming quite dangerous, quite difficult. And a lot of people started dropping out and saying, yes, we are with you, we support you, but let's not have a state demonstration, you know, it's, it's, it's dangerous. So for, for, uh, uh, for a brief period, it was the case that street demonstrations were held, but they were not announced openly in the press or anything. So, you know, if you had like a, a park sock or whatever society, you tell your members, you SMS them, you email them, but you wouldn't put it out in the public domain. <coughs> 
that of course meant that demonstrations or whatever manifestations had to be smaller. And the same thing happened to arts and culture as well. So for instance, when I was young, I remember going to Janoon concerts which had like 10,000 people there. Massive stadiums, chock a block full of people, and of course all the girls had a horrible time because all the boys were teasing them and that sort of thing, and that's not nice, but nonetheless, those were big, big concerts. Vital Science, Janoon, all these guys used to have massive concerts. And it's not just that I'm saying this as an apology for myself, really those that big, that we don't have big concerts, we do, but the <laughs> big concerts cannot occur in Pakistan anymore. Instead what we have is concerts that have 200, maybe 300, maybe 500 people. If somebody really has tight security, maybe has some help from, uh, from the army or police or whatever, from the administration, then maybe up to 1,000 people. But that's really about it. Inside closed premises, like, univers like within schools or university campuses, yes, you can have those concerts, but Public concerts in a park out of the question, if that would, if, you know, that would become a major security threat. Even cricket became, you know, as you know, the Sri Lankan cricket team was attacked and so on. The problem with all of this was that just as about 10 years ago, when I began to speak out against military dictatorship, there were very few takers, so too today do I, I find that because of the sort of uh, uh, impression that people have that the people undertaking this terrorism are motivated primarily by an opposition to US imperialism, hence are anti-imperialist, disaffected, disenfranchised youth, uh, rather than being people who were trained and equipped by the ISI <coughs> themselves to undertake terrorism in the region for their imperial and national <coughs> whatever reasons, national security reasons, etc. And now have just and now those forces have lost control of those very people. That's not the analysis. This is the analysis by the mainstream media. The result, or that India is doing it, or that America is doing it, or that Israel is doing it. So the, the, the problem now today that I face with amongst the youth is that there is a lot of misdirection and confusion about what is the source of this terrorism. Because people honestly do not know what if our establishment has been creating, cooking up, I would say, for the last 30 years, really since you know, 1978, 79. They've been cooking up these guys in, with you know, Saudi Arabia, uh, funded by Saudi Arabia, funded by Israel, funded by the United States of America, funded also by Britain and France. They've been cooking these guys for the last seven years, <coughs> and now the chickens have come home to roost. The army has lost control of the very people they created. Baitullah Masood is not someone who was unknown to those who follow politics in Pakistan. Uh, none of these people, uh, that uh, Mullah Umar or whatever, none of these people are unknown to those people who follow politics. They were well-known people amongst the religious right in any case and amongst those who were following politics on a daily basis. So when certain politicians or public figures come out and say there were no Taliban in Pakistan before the Lal Masjid, well, that simply is not true. In fact, the truth, the fact of the matter is, and you can look at any source, it is very much the Pakistan military that set up the Taliban in order to, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, 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 in accordance with their uh, whole argument about strategic depth, they believe that by sending the Tal Pashtun Taliban into, uh, into Afghanistan, they would be able to gain Afghanistan as an ally against India, have strategic depth, etc., etc. So they've been meddling with Afghan affairs for a long time. And they created, of course, they backed not only Hikmat Yar, but when Hikmat Yar failed, what was it in 92, or yeah, when he tried to take Kabul in 92, when he failed after that, they rearmed, re-equipped under Mullah's leadership, Mullah Umar's leadership, the Taliban, that's how the Taliban came into be. There's a network of 45,000 madrasas, of course, that, that provides the ideological justification for this sort of thing, for this sort of jihad, etc. And, you know, uh, most of these people who do undertake these attacks are separated uh, from society at a very young age and brought up with a very specific worldview in which they are not, they, they are unable to discern, uh, you know, a non-combatant from a combatant, an innocent civilian from uh, someone <coughs> from anyone else, and hence they are, uh, th their attacks are very, very undiscriminate, uh, do not discriminate at all. Or rather, their politics is very discriminatory and their attacks are completely indiscriminate. So, for instance, and interestingly here, the Taliban have managed to, strangely, uh, and this is pretty bad politics on their part, but lucky on our parts, man they've managed to attack nearly every single major community in Pakistan. So not only have they attacked the Ahmadis and done so proudly and openly, not only have they attacked the Sikhs and forced them to get out of Aurasai and 
uh, and of course Hindus uh, uh, they were always opposed to and still are and but and, and the Shias are of course kafirs in their in their eyes but interestingly now they've also managed to they've also started to attack the Sunni Bareilly majority by attacking Data Darbar by attacking the Sufi shrines really that is the vast majority that is the religion or the interpretation of Islam that is the most popular. So they have managed to, by doing that, isolate themselves entirely from, uh, from mainstream Pakistani society. And that's why public opinion polls are dead set against them. But still, there's a lot of confusion on this issue, precisely because, mainly because of the US occupation of Afghanistan. That still continues to cloud people's judgment. But, you know, to this audience, I would say, as I've said to all audiences, that we have, we have to, yes, of course, I have always been an opponent of, I, pardon my language, I screwed up my master's degree because I was so opposed to the war in Afghanistan that I spent all the time I had when I was in Sussex University organizing protests against the, against the NATO occupation of Afghanistan. So, uh, uh, so one has always been an opponent of the, uh, of occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan, but one also has to think very carefully that you know it's not always the case that anybody who stands up and says you know we're against Americans are you know good guys. Frankly, you have to consider that these were the very people created by uh, by imperialism for their own motives. And the most important thing that you have, one has to consider is what do they represent for Pakistan? What kind of society would they create? If they came to power, what kind of society would they create? And the answer to that isn't speculation. The answer to that is very easy to find out. They did come to power in Afghanistan. If you just go to look and look through your books and see what laws they instituted in Afghanistan, you will very easily find out what type of society they would like to create in Pakistan as well. And that's not a society that can take us forward in any way, shape, or form. Okay, that's going to take us many, many years back. So that's why I, uh, uh, for the last year, have not only been speaking out against imperialism and military dictatorship and feudalism and uh, capitalism and all the other isms uh, that they are, with the exception of socialism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, not only have I been speaking out against all of those, but then I felt it necessary that we have to speak out also against fundamentalism, against religious extremism. And uh, not because, you know, uh, not because uh, someone in the West tells you, but because it's important to us. But because I, for instance, I am a, I've been a teacher now since 1998. How many years is that? Two years. Twelve years I've been, I've been, I've dedicated twelve years of my life to teaching. I didn't have to do that. I came from a business family. I could have joined my family business, made lots of money, or I could have gone abroad like 90% of my uh, classmates did and worked abroad and made lots of money. But I thought, no man, I want to do something for my country and I want to do something that makes a contribution. And what can make a contribution? Ask any Pakistani and everybody says, the best thing to do is to educate people. So that's what I decided to do. I decided to become a teacher. I used to cycle to my class every day in the heat, in the sweltering heat, change my shirt, and then now I have a car. And I have a cycle. Uh, I progressed in life. I got married, and I, then I had to get a car. But anyway, that's <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyway, the point is that um, you cannot, uh, if, if the Taliban come to power, as it, when, they did, when they came to power in Afghanistan, one of the first things they said was women cannot go to school. They do not need to go to school, they do not need to go to university, they do not need to work outside of the home. That is the bottom line. That's 50% of your population basically being denied the opportunity to, to, to get something that is fundamental and basic for their emancipation and is, is part of their very, you know, uh, is, is very important for them. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's serious stuff. That you have to consider. Anyway, so I wrote this song. Uh, 